Welcome to Healthcare Workflow Process Improvement, Leading and Facilitating Change. This is Lecture A. The objectives for this lecture are to explain concerns expressed by participants in a process analysis and redesign scenario in terms of common change management concepts, propose strategies to gain acceptance of changes in work processes, create and critique a facilitation plan, including appropriate facilitation tools for a given process analysis and redesign scenario, and, given a healthcare change management scenario, explain outcomes in terms of common change management concepts. Leading and facilitating change is about working with people. If I were to sum up this unit in one sentence, it would be this Chinese proverb, tell me and I'll forget, show me and I may remember, Involve me, and I'll understand. Involvement is a key concept in change management. Involving people to the extent possible does three things. One, it builds understanding, a shared pool of knowledge. Two, it offers an invitation to engage in the project and influence outcomes. And three, it provides additional eyes, ears, knowledge, experience, and perspectives to inform the work. There has been a lot of work in change management, hundreds of books on the topic, and many different perspectives. It is impossible to cover everything in one unit. Thus, we will cover main points and provide some tools that practitioners can use. To begin, we will cover some key concepts of change and change management. More things like staff involvement. These key change concepts can be called upon by practitioners for use in future change efforts. These key concepts help explain what is it that causes these successful change management efforts to be successful and others to fail? From the employee's perspective, there can be a lot of changes, and a lot of changes can be overwhelming. Remember that work process change may be only one of several changes an organization is undergoing. Employees are often dealing simultaneously with regulatory and market changes that result in new job requirements, organizational changes, and process improvements all at once. Expect nothing different in clinics today. Clyes F. Janssen, 2011, conceptualized the four rooms theory of change, also called the four room apartment. He discusses changes that are usually very negatively significant to a person. Death or ending of an important relationship is the usual example but this could also be something that has the perceived potential to change one's life, including job changes, fear of loss of power, loss of importance, etc. When one of these significant changes occurs, the individual moves from the current state of contentment into denial, then into a state of confusion, possible uncertainty about the future or about how the individual can deal with the situation. Out of confusion, once the individual has worked through the confusion, comes growth and renewal, then once again, contentment comes. Simply put, at the end of every storm, fair weather returns. It is important for people working in change management situations to understand that this is an individual process, likely dependent on how the individual perceives the change. For example, how threatened, rational or not, the individual is. Also, each individual moves through the state at his, her own pace. Thus, when you approach a room of people, you will likely not know who perceives a possible threat or loss, and where in the process that person is. Many puzzle over the success and failure of change management efforts. One reason is that change management involves humans and organizations, i.e., complex situations with many different factors. Some of these include organizational constraints, lack of money or people with needed skills, or just enough people. Management style, dictatorship versus democracy. Organizational goals and departmental, division, and personal goals not necessarily in alignment. Personalities, environmental factors, for example, new regulations that force change, etc. In multi-factor situations, attribution of cause and effect is often challenging. Organizations, governments, societies, processes that are comprised of people are living, changing biological systems. 
If you try to change the system, it will compensate. The behavior of the system and individuals in it is likely dependent on the organizational culture and level of trust in leadership and trust in colleagues. Mechanistic tools like quantitative measurement, science, and engineering are valuable in providing information for better decision-making and managing and must be used in the context of an understanding of the natural system. However, such reductionist treatment rarely explains the whole. Change happens through individual choice and freedom, not through top-down control or coercion. This is not a statement that all organizations should be democracies. As we saw in Unit 7, there are many different leadership styles, ranging from one person making all the decisions to group decisions. What Key Concept 3 is saying is that it is imperative that every person's right to choose at some level be respected. The choice may be whether or not to be part of the effort, whether or not to provide input, or, in an extreme case, whether or not to continue working at an organization. Key Concept 3 does not say that everything is the employee's choice. This is usually not feasible, but change leaders should be clear about what choices employees have and should respect those choices. John Gall, M.D., in his 1978 book, Systematics said it most insightfully, systems run best when designed to run downhill. Gall, 1978. This is really the intersection between process analysis and redesign and change management. People will do things if they are easy. Processes that require extra steps are less likely to be followed. For example, asking staff to manually write down or note each hypertension patient for a quality improvement project is hard versus pulling the list from the data that are captured during the visit, which is easy. If it adds extra steps, it is a problem. I have a great example of systems running, or not, downhill. I lived in a loft in an old warehouse. There was a garden area encased in old railroad ties between the parking lot and the door. There was one place where everyone cut through the garden and it created an ugly area where nothing grew. Some insightful person bought some stepping stones and put them in the path. The garden was no longer an obstacle between the car and the door. It became a beautiful addition to our building and people automatically used the path. The person who added the stones was very insightful. Where others would have put up signs or fences, the stone putter found a way for the people and the garden to happily coexist. Another great example of this principle is in the movie Out of Africa. The 1985 movie, starring Meryl Streep and Robert Redford, set in early 1900s Kenya. The Baroness, played by Meryl Streep, is trying to start a coffee plantation in Kenya in the early 1900s. She directs the natives to reroute a river. They plead with her, explaining that it won't work, that the river will have her way in the end. But she does not listen. Toward the end of the movie, a storm comes and washes the dam out. Process design and change management is similar in that the designer has to work with and listen to people in the facility and combine their information with best practice to find the downhill way. Change starts with a deeply meaningful purpose. Which of the following would you rather be a part of? Getting a system in production, implementing a system so your practice would get the meaningful use incentives, or using health IT to improve the health or your patients. My guess is the latter, because it is a purpose that is easy to engage with on a personal level. Improving human health is deeply meaningful work to many people. Make and keep the gap between as is and to be visible, and talk about it at every opportunity. Making gaps visible maintains a creative tension, as Peter Senge calls it, that motivates forward progress. In the fifth discipline, Field Book, Senj et al. liken holding this creative tension to holding a rubber band stretched between two hands, one representing the current reality and the other representing the envisioned state. Reading from a passage from the fifth discipline Field Book by Peter Senj et al., People often have great difficulty talking about their visions, even when the visions are clear. Why? Because we are acutely aware of the gaps between our vision and reality. I would like to start my own company. 
but I don't have the capital, or I would like to pursue the profession that I really love, but I've got to make a living. These gaps can make a vision seem unrealistic or fanciful. They can discourage us or make us feel hopeless. But the gap between vision and current reality is also a source of energy. If there was no gap, there would be no need for any action to move toward the vision. Indeed, the gap is the source of creative energy. We call this gap creative tension. Imagine a rubber band stretched between your vision and current reality. When stretched, the rubber band creates tension, representing the tension between vision and current reality. What does tension seek? Resolution or release. There are only two possible ways for the tension to resolve itself. Pull reality toward the vision or pull the vision toward reality. Which occurs will depend on whether we hold steady to the vision. Senge et al. 1994 We all have a natural trouble detector. If communications in your change efforts feel like a finger trap, i.e., you feel like you are selling the change or you are pulling others along against their will, stop. Block and Nolan, the authors of Stewardship, Flawless Consulting, Block and Nolan, 1999, and Block, the author of The Answer to How is Yes, Block 2002, say it best as, it is an assault to try and change someone's mind. Minds change through individual choice, not through coercion or force. This is probably the most fundamental of the key change concepts, but also, unfortunately, it may be the hardest to learn and practice. A more tactical way to think about the don't pull concept is that people need to think through or reason through the reasons for and against change for themselves and come to an understanding of why change is needed. This is true for executives and for employees alike. It applies equally to anyone impacted by a change who is not directly involved in creating it. This should not be misconstrued as a statement that everyone needs to agree with a change. That may not be possible. It is a statement that everyone should have an opportunity to see the reasons for and against and the opportunity to think through them. A good question to ask people having difficulty with a change is, given this situation, what would you do? This is a small thought exercise to get you thinking about some of the key concepts so far. After these instructions, pause the slides and do the exercise. This should take you five minutes or so. First, think back to a time in your career, school, work, or volunteer service. When you woke up in the morning excited about coming to work, think about your work situation at that time. List three things about your situation that made your job so engaging. When you are done, restart the slides and we'll go over some common responses to this exercise. Pause the slides now. Common responses to the exercise include your own project, feeling of ownership, you were making the decisions, feeling of being in control, autonomy, and trust with co-workers. The bottom line is that many people enjoy having a project or responsibility having the authority and resources needed to do the job, and making the decisions. The same is true for managers. They are people too. And naturally, they also think it's exciting to make all decisions. Sometimes they don't realize what they take away from employees when they do. The engagement gap is a key component in change management. Dick and Emily Axelrod present this well. Axelrod 2000. When initiating a change, many organizations select a team of the best and the brightest to go off and work on the needed change. To expedite the project, the team reports to a steering committee for the change project, and the steering committee reports to a main executive. The idea is that these employees represent all employees. There is usually some requirement for communication back to and for soliciting input from their home department. Time and time again, however, this process breaks down. The team stays engaged and has the benefit of owning the project. They have an in-depth understanding of the constraints, etc., because they have spent many hours personally thinking and talking through all of the decisions. 
The rest of the organization, however, has not had these experiences, has not thought through all of the issues, and has not become engaged. Often, the same phenomena happens with the steering committee or organizational leadership. When the results and recommendations are presented, the rest of the employees respond with shock and resistance. And organizational leadership often says, this is not what we wanted. Employees don't trust what they haven't thought through, and leadership feels out of the loop. The Axelrods, 2000, in their book, Terms of Engagement, call this an engagement gap. The only way to fix it is to give everyone the benefit of the thought process and the opportunity to influence. Change management is certainly not a court of law. The phrase, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, used in the United States court system, illustrates a key change concept, transparency. Simply put, people often fail to trust what they do not see or know. People may not agree with a change, but they can understand it when provided all of the information. For example, why is the change needed, what the alternatives are, and why the proposed or decided alternative is the best. Pulling the key change concepts together, change happens best when individuals have deeply meaningful purpose, the opportunity to influence or otherwise exercise personal control or choice, transparency, and understanding. Change is primarily impacted by the individuals and organizations, culture and trust, and how the project is structured. If any of these things are out of kilter, it can undermine a change effort. If all of these are in place, a change effort has a good chance to succeed. Next, we will go over some planning tools and facilitation tools to help practitioners operationalize these principles. In Unit 7 of Healthcare Workflow Process Improvement, the student is provided strategies, tools, and aids for planning and conducting a decision-making meeting. Presented examples of agenda and tables for conducting a walkthrough of a process. And provided tools for documenting decisions made and actions identified in a decision-making meeting. In this lecture, additional strategies, tools, and aids for facilitating the change process and implementation of the streamlined process redesign are provided. We also review and provide additional perspectives for meeting facilitation. The facilitation plan may be created by the analyst or by an implementation or project manager. This F plan is the first gesture of transparency and the start of building trust. It outlines what will happen and how it will be managed. It is the social contract between the change leader and the people in an organization. The transparency displayed with the F plan is the change leader's first opportunity for input and feedback. As we go forward, we will discuss facilitation as big F and use little f to demonstrate the differences of scope, intent, and effort. Often, as in this scenario, the process analysis and redesign specialist guides the practice staff as they do the analysis and redesign, rather than doing it themselves. This scenario assumes this approach. A mid-size internal medicine practice has decided to select, purchase, and implement an electronic medical record, EMR. They have hired you as a consultant for process analysis and redesign. Your agreement with the practice is that you will provide instruction, training, and oversight for members of their staff as they analyze their processes, redesign their processes around an EMR, and define the functionality that they need in an EMR. You have already had an initial meeting with practice leadership and have had a tour and met the 75-person staff. At your next meeting, you will present the facilitation plan and get the analysis and redesign started. Over the next several slides, we will look at Big F facilitation plan for the entire effort and a little f agenda for the initial meeting. The Big F is the plan for the entire effort. The way that I show a Big F is graphically and on one page, similar to the diagram above. The Big F communicates an overall timeline and work plan and, importantly, 
is best when in communication with the rest of the organization, i.e., staff and providers not directly involved in the effort, as well as leadership. The purpose is to, one, get input on the overall plan, and two, make sure that the plan is communicated to everyone so they will know what to expect. Here, we have assumed that the work needed by the practice can be accomplished in four weeks. The time for different practices will vary. With 75 staff and additional providers and leadership, it will usually not be possible for everyone to be heavily involved in the effort. Here, we apply a two-group plan similar to those described by the axle rods. Group 1 is the team that will be doing the work. Group 2 is the rest of the organization. Group 1 will spend a significant portion of their time analyzing and redesigning the practice processes, usually 50% to full time. Group 2, the rest of the organization, must be kept up to date and engaged in the effort. In other words, Group 2 needs to be efficiently walked through the planned process and the results as those become ready, as well as the thought processes that produce them. Importantly, you and leadership will need to communicate how Group 1 was chosen. Some do this by invitation. For example, an email to everyone describing the commitment and what is needed and inviting interested folks to step forward. If too many, sometimes the number that can be spared the effort will be randomly chosen. Others choose a team of the latter. Remember the engagement gap. This depends on leadership on the amount of effort that can be afforded, talent available, and provider and staff interests. Usually, Group 1 includes a representative from each of the major roles, or at least someone familiar with them. The most important thing about the Big F is that it sets expectations for regular communication, so that as the team goes through the thought process, the rest of the organization and leadership goes through the process too. For a small 10-person practice, an elaborate plan like this is not necessary. The key criterion is that everyone is informed and has the opportunity to influence the project. The little f, facilitation for process inventory, occurs early in the process. It is needed to facilitate the team in creating a list of all of the major processes. It is usually used in an initial meeting followed by someone creating the list or spreadsheet followed by group review and revision. The product of the little f facilitation is a process inventory that can be provided at walkthrough one. Expect some revisions based on the broader review. Recall the importance of a detailed agenda for meeting facilitation as presented in unit seven. Similarly, the little f week one agenda should include an introduction to overall project, how the team was selected, what their charge is, the big F plan, and timeline and scope. This agenda should also include context diagram overview review and a group context diagram creation. It may be helpful to include exercises where the group will think, pair, share, perform sorting and grouping of recommended changes, and make assignments of processes inventory work and assignments for preparing for and conducting walkthroughs. Like week one, training needs to occur, but this time it is training about how to do a process diagram and analysis. Also, there is group work on an example process and opportunities for discussion and feedback. It is anticipated that clinic staff will go off on their own and complete the analysis for discussion at the next meeting. Like weeks one and two, training needs to occur, but this time it is training on common EHR functionality and on how to match functionality to clinic needs and analysis results. Also similar to weeks one and two, there is group work on an example process and opportunities for discussion and feedback. It is anticipated that clinic staff will go off on their own and complete the redesign for discussion at the next meeting. The walkthrough is a meeting with the broader organization, i.e., staff who are not on the team to keep them up to date about the project's progress and the team's current thinking. It is also an opportunity to keep all staff engaged and to get feedback on the plan. Thus, all participants should be encouraged to talk as much as the project team. 
For example, instead of presenting the context diagram, cut the shapes up and get the group to put it together. Pin the tail on the donkey. Or have them take five minutes and individually draw one. Then shout out components. For process inventory, pass out the list, have people look at it for five minutes, and identify things missed. There should be a walkthrough every time the team finishes a major project. Don't forget about leadership. They need to be engaged as well. For a leadership agenda, try Brief Review of Progress, Presentation of Challenges, Review and What Did We Miss Exercises, Engaging Questions, Any Surprises Based on What's Presented, Get Help Strategizing About Challenges. Leadership should have input into prioritizing processes for analysis and redesign. During the project, you should keep a list of things that leadership should decide or have input into. For example, do we want an EHR that also has patient management system, PMS functionality, or should we stay on the same PMS and build an interface? It is the team's responsibility to make advantages and disadvantages of such decisions clear. This concludes Leading and Facilitating Change. At this point, the student should be aware that the method and plan don't matter as much as adhering to principles of change management. The example method here, big F, little f, and the two-group process is only one example.